two or three over two or three years, the hours are that people spend talking about what happens if the college there's an outbreak of bed bugs, you know, things like that. And what you know, what what will that mean in terms of the income? What will that you know mean in terms of the future of the and, and you know ludicrous things? Um, and people spend forever talking about those things and. You know, it's, it's, it is, it's a fiction. Yeah, the only thing keeping you safe in, in American healthcare is the heroic efforts of doctors and nurses and frontline personnel, housekeeping and pharmacists, those people. And, and, they, and they, they do their best, honestly, but the problem is they, they cannot have a long-term approach because those funds and those resources belong to the metasystemic levels, which actually don't, uh, as, some, as several of us have pointed out, as Beer would say, what is the purpose of the American healthcare system? It's to make money. Mm -hmm. And that's what the top does extremely well. But they don't know anything yeah. about safety because safety is a risk to, to be mitigated, not to be created at the front line because the top doesn't know what the front line is. No, no, it's true. I agree with that. That's, I say that's you know, true of education, increasingly true of educational systems, you know, in that you kind of turn them into a way of extracting a public education system, turn it into a way of means of extracting value. All you're interested in is m mitigating for your uh, capital, mitigating any risk on your capital investment, not kind of how you manage changing environments that system that's the last thing and actually you know, it's it's a it's kind of not that good for capitalism really i suppose you know because it's quite short term really and you know if capitalism go, goes through these cycles of collapse and crash and chaos mm -hmm. you know, let me let me share this last piece because i was on the executive team of this big company for for two years i couldn't take it and they couldn't take having me there after a few years so it was great for us to part company but what i learned at that level was the way the company was run was fundamentally to reverse engineer the company based on the parameters set out by the bond raters so when the bond rate because they most most hospitals are in debt and their biggest risk is that their bond rating drops and so literally the smartest people in the, at that level i mean they're they're not unintelligent people they would actually get the requirements from the bond raters and they would design the company at that level yeah. uh, based on that it's that i mean that's cynical but i got to tell you that's what i saw well, bondage is the future for universities, and a number of yeah. universities have now put themselves into bondage, including Cambridge, Liverpool, Manchester, well, and so on. Yeah, Cambridge, Cambridge is a kind of marginal game claim because they don't need to do that. You know, they, they, they actually don't need to. They're one of the first in the they're UK. They're one of the first, but the only reason is, you know, they're able to kind of, they're able to attract a good rate that then they can, you know, um, use in their... Whatever, whether it's uh, investing in capital to get a good, you know, capital investments like buildings, just fill it in with kind of effectively rent paying academics, you know, because the full economic cost, of, you know, so universities just securing a rent off that capital investment. The other one, they can just bung it in their endowment funds. And, you know, if they've got a low enough rate, they get, I think through, they get 5.75 over, you know, the base rate on their return on the university's collective endowment, but there's no need to have debt apart from just to kind of expand their rate of accumulation. Mm. You know, they've got, they've got assets to the tune, collective assets to tune about 10 billion. Mm. So, you know, they're very rich, mm. but you know, again, they just become financialized. Um, and, you know, the, the preoccupation with the, Chief Financial Officer in Cambridge. I think he's probably the most well-paid member of staff in the university. I think he's in excess of half a million pounds a year, and he's an ex-city guy. Of course, he would be. Uh, but they, you know, they, you know, his his role really is to kind of manage this and you know manage the ongoing um, valuation of the and risk of the organisation as a whole, and then. Also, I mean, a lot of people don't kind of didn't see this with the connection with the pension strike that's happened over the last few years is effectively what's happening. Cambridge took the lead in this in de-risking. And uh, one of the things in de-risking was to reduce the actuarial risk of the pension liabilities from the U university superannuation scheme. 
and so to shift that from uh, equities to government bonds so lowering the risks and these are kind of like marginal percentage gains for the university that are worth millions mm. you know and uh, the same thing with shifting more staff to more precarious contracts it reduces the level of risk you know in having people tied into permanent yeah. contracts yeah. so this is all about that and it's not being talked about really and you know even even the union i'm member a member of is not uh really um you know kind of doing a very good job of kind of highlighting the you know the economics of this sorry but i've taken us off piste i think oh but i'm not sure you have um oh, okay. i mean really um, I, I interrupt i mean i think what's really interesting is that we're talking about universities moving into risk management and if you think, and Mark was talking about, you know, people at the senior end of an organization essentially just re-engineering it to, to get the bond rate. And if you think about it, the big criticism in corporate governance and in, in strategy of, of senior executives and boards of directors at the moment is that they manage to incredibly short time frames. So in fact, they're not doing strategy, they're doing risk management. Um, mm. And risk management is managing the knowing because risk is when you can calculate those probabilities. Mm. What they're supposed to be paid for is managing uncertainty. Mm. Well, you can't calculate the risk. That's the definition of it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So when we when we enter into sort of worlds where boards are accountable to shareholders, to um, bondholders who are working on very short time frames, the argument is that they're working in incredibly short incentive sets and not investing for the long term. What's fascinating about you know privatized healthcare and where universities are going, but we shouldn't be, is that we're doing the same. We're working on really, really short timeframes when we have no need to, because that's not actually the timeframes we work on. It's because we've made so much of our revenue contingent on things that are extremely fluctuate in terms of student income. Mm. So the minute you get addicted to taking large amounts of fee income from students who can come in and out relatively quickly, you've put yourself in a corporatized world. In essence, but we shouldn't have. Um, uh, Elizabeth, the, I, I heard our governor's healthcare aide tell us on a conference call, you know, 15, 18 years ago, that they, the governor, who was a Democrat and uh, sensibly believed in all the stuff we did at our community, this is not the hospital now, this is the whole community, um, that they wouldn't make any decisions that had a time a payback horizon longer than two years because of the cycle for re election, because yeah. you've got it. And so to me, that's why I only focus on civil society now, because business and government have such short cycle spans that it's only mothers, you know, that have a long cycle span, mothers and grandmothers. I'm uh -huh. sorry. And it is, it, it is absolutely the time frame that we're, we're incentivizing people to work too. There's no reason we have to do it. It's because we've adopted a form of economic model that actually specifies that, you know, markets can allocate resources efficiently. And then we pretend that ultimately the bond rate is the determinant of what that price is that then moves out over every other asset class. It's a failed economic theory, but we're still addicted to it. And, you know, Steve referred to the failure of capitalism. It's, it's quite a complex set of things that are going on there. But ultimately, if we allow people to be incentivized in very, very short windows, then you're going to get suboptimal behavior. They're going to invest, they're going to spend, not on what you need to do to create a safe culture, because that's a long-term, long-haul investment. They're going to do what's short-term. Is there bed bugs in the bedding? <laughs> Versus how many beds do we really need long-term to make this viable? That, that, that's actually really interesting. I mean, while that, we were sort of talking, while you were talking there, um, Elizabeth, I was just thinking about, you know, these, uh, you know, ludicrous risk register discussions that I've had and been involved in. Um, what would a conversation, what would a team of managers conversation have to do genuinely to address change and uh, making an organisation adaptable and viable in Stafford Beer's term? What kind of conversation would I be having and would that look like? What kind of considerations would we have if it wasn't kind of perverted in the way it is? Mark's going to go. <laughs> yeah, I, I have a pretty strong uh, feeling about that and a, a lot, 20 years of experience. You go down to the unit level 
and start having the primary conversations be at the unit level with the people who do the work, mm -hmm. find out what it is they can do, what it, what it is they need, and only have the level above take care of the excess variety uh, that they can't do. That's the only way. That, that's what biology always does. You know, and I, it's risky to say that with John on the call, so he can really undermine me pretty quickly. But my understanding of, bi of biology is that the next emergent le the next level always emerges so it's always in support of the level above and if it becomes predatory the, the organisms cease to exist we try to do the impossible and there's i can tell the impossible we try to get some people together and imagine creating the levels below and for two reasons one i don't think imagination is that strong i think history <laughs> you know millions of years is a much better thing than a bunch of smart people trying to figure it out and the other thing is the decision makers are populated from below. They're not metasystemic. They're not metacognitive. So you end up building a structure that might even be the right structure. And you keep populating with people who aren't wise. I mean, that, that wise word is really, really interesting because I've been working on expertise. And one of the things that sort of we really know very little about is how people acquire expertise with the ultimate being wisdom. Yeah. And so... You know, we can Carl White. Carl White stuff. had some cool things to say about that. Yeah, he does. He does. But Carl uh, White. So did White. Aristotle. Sorry. So did Aristotle. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which might highlight how much we're grappling with it. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's interesting to say about expertise because one of the things that I kind of came into this this was about you know teaching expertise and how that's learned and. Uh, you know, kind of still working on that area. And it's quite interesting that in that respect about how that expertise is gained. And, you know, we, as, start, we, as we've started to think about that in terms of, you know, starting out from social psychology and self-concepts, but start to think about self-concepts as kind of cognitive and effective systems. And that's been really fruitful in understanding this delicate balance between... Uh, involving affect, you know, the physiological, uh, the biological, and the cognitive, and um, how that um, becomes viable in a kind of situation where you need to be expert, like in teaching, I suppose the same would be in medicine. You know? Steve, because, uh, I mean, we had a chat yesterday, and of course, yeah. this, this is Piaget's project, isn't it? Y yeah, I think, I mean, it's, it's funny in writing the last thing about this and it's it is about teacher expertise about teaching the very beginning but um yeah i mean you know the the i think the thing for piaget really important was the kind of the self schema or the self schemata i mean which is a kind of kantian idea that not and i can't find many analytic philosophers who really understand what Kant's on about when he talks about transcendental schemata but i think it's the thing that nudged Piaget to, you know, to have this construct of self acting in the world. But for Piaget, and, and uh, this was forgotten with what came after that in terms of these kind of psychological constructivists who kind of got this cognitive construct and they dropped the biological and the effective part uh, in, in that. But Piaget, for Piaget, that was, you know, this interesting kind of like the relationship sort of set, going from the sensory motor, uh, sensory motor phase and then building, you know, this cognitive physiological cell schemata of how, how I operate in the world, which is kind of being constantly updated. And when you're expert, you become recognizably competent in that uh, area, in, in, a, in an area. It's a very social judgment, but it's also a kind of very real thing as well. I mean, I raise Piaget because it, it kind of it brings us back to perhaps the, the, the themes of these discussions in the sense that so many of these, these um, bullshit communications which are occurring at a, a managerial level are taking My place... Email, my inbox is filling with them. As well, but they're, they're taking place to the complete exclusion of any, any conception of biology. And, and the fact that we're all biological entities and actually there is a logic to that stuff and it seems that we are determined to defy the logic. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I, I agree. I think that, you know, it's a, um, there's a, a sense that, that, you know, the, the 
uh, creation of lots of communication that is of no value mm. is a very useful way of just slightly destabilizing people and keeping them organized in a you know in a um, in an unhealthy hierarchical way because i don't think hierarchies necessarily need to be unhealthy but i think that just it, it's just a way of you know um keeping your mind occupied rather than uh, you know meditating on what the real issues are i suppose so uh, can i can i ask john i mean because it, it seems that we're deceiving ourselves and certainly our organizations are deceiving themselves in very fundamental ways and we've had plenty of wise people who've talked about organizations and said what's wrong with them but we've successfully managed to ignore all of them and and the question is why and how do we fix this uh, i've said before and i'll say again can you hear me okay yeah so what i've said before and i'll say again is that we don't acknowledge the fact that we our origins are in an ambiguity and the way we co we've coped with that up until this juncture, as far as I'm concerned, is through deception. Trevor's yeah. comments about deceptive, self-deception, deceptive deception of others, and it's it's pervasive. I went to a symposium at the social work school at uh, UCLA a few years back. There's this whole symposium on deception. There are people who study this stuff. Mm -hmm. It's a cottage industry, but it's accepted. It's like, well, that's the way things are. I don't think so. In thinking about coming to this meeting today, I was thinking about, for me and the people I care about, you know, the golden rule is very important, you know, do unto others. I think we really have to start thinking about do unto the cosmos, as the cosmos would have uh, it do unto us. Ah. So what I'm saying is that the one thing, the one salient feature that I've glommed onto that I think is universal is the acceptance that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. However, in the kind of system that you're talking about where you know risk management people call the shots that's referred to as regression to the mean and if you want to be an average institution amongst average institutions fine but that's not going to be long lasting it's that what steve was saying is about that you know this uh, the, the you know rise plateau and fall it, we accept that as the state of being and it doesn't have to be in my opinion mm. so and, and when you, I mean, I'm not an expert on Piaget. I only know what I, uh, you know, learned in child psych back 50 years ago. But, you know, when, when Piaget talked about having to go through the different stages because, you know, in service to these big brains we have, that was reasoning after the fact. That's not what's happening. Epigenetically, what you're doing is you're putting yourself into a certain stage of life and you're collecting epigenetic data from that, at that stage. So it's state specific. So it affects your, your, so we were born with only 30% of our, of our brain capacity on average. You know, some of us yeah. a little more, some of us a little less. And that, and that other 70% is being acquired over, the, over, the, over your childhood, over your adolescence, into teenhood. And um, I think we, it's, it's age 27, something like that. We stop, our brains stop, stop developing or maybe de in, a, in a measurable way. I think mine's still working okay. <laughs> Uh, in terms of plasticity, but I, and I'm rambling on here, but I do think that there is a misconception in the way that we understand ourselves and the cosmos, and it's very hard to implement um, these ideas because the, the the ruling paradigm is one of a profit margin, and as Elizabeth was saying, I fully agree. And once you start to you know verticalize everything and you measure everything as a on a on a, you know, as a, on a cost benefit uh, or um, profit margin. Um, you know, this is what you get. It's not going to be uh, long lasting. And for me, the problem is that philosophically is particularly in, a, in an educational organization. So I, I had my comeuppance when I became junior faculty at Harvard Medical School and I got a letter from the Harvard Corporation. I thought, corporation? Really? Huh? So basically, you know, it's all about square footage and uh, how much overhead you can bring in because that makes the, you know, the administrators smile because it's unencumbered money. That's the NIH system. Huge amounts of money are, are misappropriated in the name of biomedical research. We know that. <laughs> and we're all, we're, you know, us investigators were just pawns in this great system. But my point being that I think if the whole is not greater than the sum of its parts, it will fail. It, it has to. Gravity's going to get us all. So, yeah. So, so Peter, have you got, is your nilpotent quantum mechanics a cosmological golden rule? I think uh, yeah, definitely it is, yes. Right. Um, you, you can't buck the system, really, the, the, the natural system. And, you know, that always applies on everything at any level. 
because it seems it seems that we've got i mean increasingly i'm trying to think of what what it is we're talking about it seems that it's it's we've got nil potent quantum mechanics and increasingly it seems to me we've got a nil potent epigenetics i mean is, is that is that fair john do you well, think? certainly we have if nil potency is true for any conservation of energy system or any system which manages energy mm. input output and it's always true you can always write it in that form and so it's always true and you know, this is the, the way nature operates. It, you, you balance the, the cis, your system against the rest of nature mm. and, and deal with it that way. And it's interesting to think back to Piaget's project because uh, Piaget, I think, had a very profound intuition that all of these things were connected, but he, he couldn't really spell out why. And I think we're, we're, talking, we're talking in a more powerful way about how these things might be connected. Yeah, I think there's no, there's no question that there is a series of hierarchical structures which follow that procedure and forever and ever and at every level. So just quickly, I mean, I'm just, I just submitted a manuscript in which I'm laying claim to the idea that we've, mis, we've misunderstood the process of evolution, which is really key to understanding. I mean, you know, Dobchansky said that evolution was all biology. So the hypothesis is that we focused on the material aspect. That's what Darwin does. He tells us that, that evolution is material because we're material. But the reality is that in the way that I sort of stumbled into all of this and I merged ontogeny and phylogeny and basically they cancel one another out materially and all you have left is the energy transfer all the way from the Big Bang to the present. So by, by mis misunderstanding the premise, you misunderstand means and ends. And so of course you come up with this bollocksy stuff because we're, we're just reasoning after the fact, which we know is illogical. But we, have, uh, we do have other options. You know, so Dennis Noble started this thing, the, you know, the third way of evolution, for example. Yeah. Um, you know, so, and, and Dennis is trying to um, you know, stir the pot here and get people thinking out, outside of the box. But, um, and, and again, again it's, it's, it's very difficult to translate this into action. But I, I would maintain that at least being, you know, it's why I put that proof rock thing and I annotated it to say, you know, if we were to teach people that what you see is not necessarily what you get, no matter what expertise you, you, you uh, identify with, it's not an end, it's a means. It's yeah. always a means towards understanding the greater good, you know, how everything is interconnected, you know, this, this web of of inter, uh, this networking process that we all uh, engage in, but we don't really think of it in real time because the system is just not, um, you know, you're not going to be a, a long-term CEO of, an, of, a, of a corporation if you're going to think in these terms because that's not how you're rewarded. You should be. But is, isn't it that we are, we're making all these speech acts. I mean, it, all of this just seems to be bullshit speech acts in boardrooms. And we don't see the connection between the speech acts, the language that we're using, and the biology that it comes from, and the history of, that it comes from in terms of our personal history, the history of the, 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 the whole, you know, group and so on. Um, and we don't have... We don't have a sufficiently developed lens for seeing that stuff. And maybe that's maybe that's a job that we should set ourselves is to create a, a lens through which we can see this stuff more clearly. But but if the if if I'm correct in, in sub, sub, submitting, I think it's has to be some you know true either with a small t or a capital T that economics. Elizabeth, I know you're in the room, so I'm sort of a little bit. Um, I'm not just <laughs> but if economics is just an an express a. a um, a mass expression of the human condition. And as I said many iterations ago, we're still thinking about, you know, Vitruvian man, bilateral symmetry and, you know, Da Vinci's thing. That's not what we're all about. We're all about cells and atoms and how those, all those things come together in a coalesce in a meaningful way. My point being that if we measure economics as supply and demand, that's very superficial. What we, I think what we should be using is a measurement of Gibbs free energy, because that's how this physiology yeah. So why wouldn't economics work that way too? You know, that would be a much more holistic and integrated way to make those, and you can do it. I know you can do it. I'm convinced of that. But, you know, but, you know, people have won the Nobel Prize in economics for doing other than that, right? <laughs> anyway. I, I, I I can, can, yeah, sorry. 
if I can risk, you know, turning it upside down and making a complete fool of myself, Chris Argerus did a lot of good work for a long time, uh, basically seeing why bad decisions were made at the corporate board level and above. And my interpretation of what he came up with was mere embarrassment is all it takes saving face, not your own face, saving face to somebody across the table from you is all it takes in, in really important decisions and small decisions face saving isn't an issue, but in big decisions where you make them really look stupid, peer, people are paying, have huge salaries. They will actually uh, self silence in order not to, they will ensure bad decisions. And he did enough research to convince me that he's right. And so in that context, you have to ask yourself, does this have anything to do with biology except the biology of fear? And, and then the last thing I'll say, and it would be a longer discussion, but two people who got their masters from, from uh, Chris Argerus built a tool that I used in the corporation to solve intractable problems because it anonymously allowed people to see their differences in points of view and then have conversations non-fear-based conversations around those and then people would make great decisions so i i mean i i love biology i love physics but when you get right down to it you have to say what's making this person in this boardroom at this moment make such a bad decision yeah no but the biology of fear is a very important thing and um i've, I've been speaking to a number of people talking about the level of fear in their organizations and how this is so corrosive so now if if John, I understand you right. The biology of fear is, is we're talking about epigenetic marks of, of things like cortisol and that kind of stuff. Is that right? Sure. Yeah. No, I've, I've said it in a previous Zoom. Um, I think we are the only organism destroying the planet and ourselves because we know that we're mortal. That's what drives fear. Mm. But I would like to think that a larger cosmologic understanding of what we're all about would open up to the possibility of reducing the fear because we understand that that our mortality, you know, it's not material. I just was saying it's it's energy flows, and so once we, you know, we understand Whitehead, uh, you know, um, his philosophy. Again, it's it's not easy to do, but I think it's much more conducive to a lot to a a more well a more informed way of thinking than the hand to mouth kind of existence that we seem to be pursuing, um, which as, as Mark was saying, I fully agree. You know, the, you need some fear in order to uh, learn. Uh, you need some adrenaline in order to learn, but too much adrenaline and, it, and you, you, you know, you blank, you blank out because it's that fight or flight thing. What we really want to be in the sweet spot of is problem solving. We want to be able to think that we can reason our way out of problems. When, when, the, when we have the option. But if we turn away from, um, uh, you know, if we, if we continue to, to think in terms of, you know, Promethean fire and, you know, and, and the invention of the wheel and, um, and real-time mechanics instead of quantum mechanics, I think that's what we're stuck with. On the other hand, I think that quantum, so that's, that article I sent you, Mark, from the New York Times about, and uh, Rich Heiberger actually said that there was something in the Scientific American about, that, about this idea that, Rich, did you read it? So, so it's this question of, you know, quantum mechanics seems to be, you know, the, um, the, phys the, the physics of, of, of what we really are talking about. But the problem is we can't make it relevant to our lives. But that's because we are thinking backwards about our lives. Once we reorient ourselves, the evolutionary trajectory and the quantum mechanics align with one another. But isn't this where we need uh, some kind of empirical movement? I mean, I remember a very um, unhappy time in a former university, which was run by a, a complete despot, and um, he's still there. Um, and he was instigating a regime of terror in, in the university, across the whole university. And at one point I summoned the courage to go up to him and say, please don't do this. This is really a very bad thing to do. You know, you're instilling fear amongst the staff is just gonna kill the place. He turned around to me and said, where's the evidence for that? <laughs> and um, I, I think we have to answer his question. 
Well, but if, if everything around you is fear driven, then of course it looks like it's normative, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, when I, in this paper that I submitted on energy flow, when Rich and I talked yesterday, he pointed out, I mean, we concluded that I had to find some empiric evidence that supported what I was talking about. And I found it. The, uh, the retinal, retinal cells in your eye can detect one photon. That's quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. And there's evidence that photons do affect biologic systems. So unfortunately, I thought maybe smell had evolved, you know, the, uh, the science of smell had evolved further than it has. It's the, you, I can't say that for smell, although the, the data suggests that that's true. My point being that we already live within a quantum mechanical reality. We just don't measure things that way because, you know, it's like Bohr said, yeah, it's, du it's duality of light. It's just a matter of how you measure it. If we had the option of measuring things um, more um, accurate or um, in quantum mechanical terms, we might be able to see the relationships empirically. And I think it's there. We just have to, you know, we have to be more dedicated to that idea, in my opinion. So I, I, just to just come back to, are we net looking for nil potency at all these different levels of organization? So, so Peter's got, obviously his physics comes back to nil potence. What we seem to be talking about with um, the cellular stuff is some sort of nil potency in the, in your first principles of physiology. If we can actually see this, if, if there are ways that we can actually go out and measure this stuff, and maybe it is in, in Fitbits or um, whatever other kind of physiological data we might pick up from people, there will certainly be patterns. And is, is that worth doing? And how might we go about doing it? So I don't know, Peter, I mean, I think we've agreed that, so my homeostasis really is an expression of nil potency. Mm. And the reason that we continue to evolve is because the environment is constantly changing. We need to maintain the equipoise with the environment. And that's why evolution is critical for our survival. You know, if we don't do that, we become extinct because, you know, if we hardwire ourselves to the existing environment, we're, you know, basically we're screwed because we don't have, we don't have the capacity to, to um, remain in that, um, that relationship with that cosmologic vector that, you know, that emanated from that explosion, right? At least that's why I think about it until, you know, somebody proves otherwise. <laughs> yeah, so I agree with you that I think that there, are, there should be, there are ways to measure it. Um, you know, spit in a tube and measure cortisol. Uh, it's a little more complicated than that. Yeah, yeah. But, but, uh, but you know, this is why I'm so upset about what's happening in my country now. <laughs> Because it, there have been times in our history when, it, you know, fear like Joe McCarthy, but that we thought that was a one-off. Now we have Donald Trump. You, you can rule by, you know, using fear, but it's not productive. It's counterproductive. And that's not what this country is all about. I've lost my country as far as I'm concerned. And I hope the hell we find it again. Because, you know, pragmatism and inventiveness and that sense of can do is being killed by this uh, you know, our president. So I'll leave it. At Mark, that. Mark's just had it given as a request to define nil potent. <laughs> right, Kapisa, that's one for you. Yeah. Well, John, if one takes a fundamental particle, a fermion, then its wave function turns out to be a square root of zero, and the other part of the 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 process is the rest of the universe. So if you multiply the fermion by the rest of the universe, you get zero. And so whatever changes in the particle, has to ch there has to be a corresponding change in the rest of the universe. Whatever changes in the universe, there has to be a corresponding change in the particle. Okay. You can also consider larger scale systems to be operate like that. There has to be a totality zero, uh, a combination of zero. In what, every do case. Mean, what do you mean by multiply? What's the operation? I mean, I mean actual multiplying as in algebra and arithmetic. You, thank you, you yeah. Peter. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just want to, it's, it's, it's lovely, it's brilliant, and it's almost understandable. It's understandable enough. So back to Andrew's comment. To me, I'm not a, a mathematician. My best friend is an amazing mathematician, but boy, I am a horrible one. So I can, here's what I'm going to do with that, unless you tell me, to forget it. I'm going to not worry about the X square or the multiplication, but just take it as a generalization that anything you change uh, is in a dance with everything else. And you really shouldn't ignore that. Absolutely. 
Yes. All, yeah. but, 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 I mean, uh, John's talking about the energy, and it is the energy that you're really multiplying. Ah, ah okay. Okay, and, and to me, whether it's multiplication, it, the, the it, object, I, I don't know that I need to know that. The mathematical term is an energy term, energy momentum mass term. And that's what that's what squares to zero, according to um, Einstein's equations of. Uh, so I read Peter's book, yeah, um, and I kind of skimmed the heart, the heavy mass mass. But what I, the one big thing that I gleaned from the book, uh, the foundations of, of physics uh, uh, book, was that you know the introduction of zero into the mathematical system was an attractor. The introduction of the cell into as biology was is also an attractor. They're, they are homologues of one another. The, the cell is imitating zero. So that, that's the way I understand null potency is. Well, I don't know if that so, so, yeah, well, well, let me ask you this, because this could help me or, or you know, I could quit doing what I'm doing and go sailing. Uh, I'm, I think, introducing to my own world the idea that the neighborhood is the cell in sociology. And that people are are move at the speed, relatively speaking, the speed of uh, biochemistry. But the cell, the living part, is the neighborhood for what I care about. And therefore, this idea of nil potency also applies to neighborhoods, because without neighborhoods, there is no life. Right. And so what I did again, I don't. I, I sound like a total narcissist, but at any at the risk of sounding like you heuristically like that. So there, there's this burgeoning idea in biology of, of uh, niche construction, which actually was an old idea, which now has been reinvented with ep epigenetics. But niche construction is, you know, like beaver built, beavers build dams, humans build, you know, houses and towns and cities and city states and et cetera, until you get to Gaia. So I thought, oh, well, maybe this, the unicell was the first niche construction because that's what endosymbiotic theory is. It's the internalization of environmental factors that are, pose an ex existential th threat. So now you have this integration of the cell and its environment in a very holistic way, which actually does account for like uh, Nick Christakis, this guy at Yale, is an epidemiologist. He's shown in terms of computer models that that's how humans behave. They behave, you know, and he has this contagion theory because he has to relate it to, med to medicine somehow to keep his, uh, you know, his credentials at Yale Medical School, but, but, that, but he's right. For, for all the, you know, the reasons that I just iterated, because um, that's how it works. Okay, so I'm agreeing with you, Mark, but, but the neighborhood yeah. and, the, and the cell are one and the same. Right, right, right. So let me ask uh, Peter a question. I, I, you know, I'm listening to you guys with great interest, in, and I keep, uh, I think about scales a lot. And you guys, every once in a while, will mention a new scale and say, oh, that nilpotent applies there. So is the, here's the general question. Is nilpotent you know, potency, a, a useful way to think about life at every single scale. Yeah, and it's been nature tries to always get a zeroing. And that's what's happening at every scale. Everything that can be organized as any kind of system is trying to, in a way, zero itself with the rest of the environment. Is this related to Hamilton's, you know, stuff, you know, I, I, which I can't follow either, but it sounds like <laughs> Hamilton's equations and then Nothier, or however you pronounce yeah. your name, it sounds like they're, they're in yeah, league Hamilton's with you. Hamilton's equations are conservation of energy equations. They're incorporated into quantum mechanics. And so you, you can always represent them in that way, in this way. You can always represent anything like that in this way. It, it's all, a, it's, it's a it's another way of representing that that structure. So when, when when I annoy people regularly by saying only the easiest thing has ever happened, I'm in complete agree. You're in, you and I are in agreement. <laughs> well, it, it 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 does the, it does it goes by the quickest route, the the simplest, whatever it is. It will always do that. Wait, quantum physics goes by all possible routes simultaneously. Oh yes, indeed. But but so, the averaging all out that turns out to be what you consider to be the simplest route. And, and I think to, to Mark's point of view, point earlier, if we don't do that, if we, if we get out of balance somehow with that as a society, it's going to die. I think, I think you, didn't you say something like that, Mark, 15 minutes ago? I, I think it's very interesting. You see, I mean, it, it's kind with, this is Gaia really at, at, a, at a deep level. Um, it's going to do something that brings things back into balance at some point. <laughs> 
You see, I, I think this is really interesting from, for economists, because in the sense that all policy is meant to be made on the basis of Pareto optimality. So the idea is that you can't make anyone better off without making someone else worse off. So you're in a Pareto optimal outcome as long as you've achieved that. So any change to the system will make some people better off and some people worse off, and that's bad. That's the sort of underlying objective of all, all economic theory and policy. Does that say you can't possibly make the pie bigger? <laughs> resources are fixed. In all economics, there's a finite set of resources. So that's, that's how they get around it. Um, Technology overcomes that. Yeah. It's meant to. Um, and that then becomes the external exogenous shock that will allow the system to increase the pie. Um, I mean, that, that, that was the old monetarist, theory, not monetarist, <laughs> not bullionist and all that kind of thing that they used to have in long time ago. You know, where it was the only certain supply of money and that was all that was available. It was money theory. Um, what I find fascinating in, in economics, though, if you think about that as the system tries to zero itself effectively is what they're saying in their own clunky way, is the one thing that economics has always struggled with is value. So if the market can't price it, then it's not actually a resource. It becomes an externality. So a train that goes through an area of housing and it pollutes your washing, it hasn't created another product, which it has, it's created pollution that you haven't asked for, but they've supplied, that's simply an externality. So what we then try to do is make it a market and they try to price it. But the, the solution is always to try and price something. But if you're gonna price something, you have to understand value. And it's the very thing economics says nothing about. So, and yeah, I think that's, and um, so the limit of resources, the limit of capacity to quantify a value for resources, not so much the limit of resources. So technology um, creates new ideas. It creates new products. It creates- Yeah, it creates new things. ways of valuing. Um, so more sophisticated algorithms give us more sophisticated ways of valuing. But I, I just kind of connecting this with nil potency and connecting across economics and social psychology here, kind of like uh, my kind of uh, train of connections here is kind of thinking, you know, because I say I spent a bit of time with Spencer Brown stuff, you know, thinking about nil potency and what you were just saying uh, there, Peter, in terms of this kind of, you know, this kind of zero that creates, it almost feels like that. It's a, mm. a zero that from which uh, is forever there, but is forever part of a creative action. And that seems to be resonate with me at the heart of what Spencer Brown's about. about. And then from this, from those, we just get, well, I suppose in simplified terms, just kind of different kinds of fractals, you know, uh, you know, different kinds of uh, shapes of things uh, that emerge from these very simple kind of uh, this very simple idea of nil potency. And, and I suppose then I kind of imagine, you know, this kind of, uh, you know, a cognitive system as a kind of, you know, as a as this kind of fractal that's emergent from nil potency at, at a quantum level but it is, it is fractal there's no question it's fractal because it applies it every if you open up anything you'll find yeah. there'll be an auth, another thing of that kind and inside that will be another thing of that kind. yeah and i think you know just seeing that how kind of i think the important thing for you know the important idea i'm kind of trying to wrestle with with in terms of fractal is how the what these things are is so much the not so much the repetition but the fact that they kind of emergent from nothing almost you know they uh, you know and and that gives us some very rich patterns and shapes and organizations in which then that we can do reason and uh, you know and 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 communicate um perhaps and i suppose then within that is those same systems are uh, you know result in algorithms and processes that lead us to kind of creating value or, or determining value of things. So, you know, there's a, there's a kind of, within that, I suppose you get from, you can make some, I've kind of skipped a lot of working out there, but you can get some steps from the quantum, um, the quantum physics through to social psychology and through to economics 
you know, and with, with plenty of maths in there, I, I suspect. And we can pick up the biology along the way as well, of course, there, because we can see lots of biological mechanisms that are using this in, in living things. So, you know. Yeah, but the critical thing, and I'm sorry to interject, but I think the critical factor here yeah. is, is understanding what epigenetics, how epigenetics works. Because basically, it's like the Red Queen in Alice. She's running as fast as she can to stay in one place, to remain in, at equipoise. We yeah. do the same thing. We don't recognize it because we think of the arc of our life cycle, you know, from birth to death and everything that happens in between is, you know, what we're all about. But in reality, it's all in service to the unicellular state remaining at equipoise. And why I say that is because the way epigenetics works is the organism is um, delegating the phenotype, which we normally think of as an inventory of, tra of traits, which it's not. It's really how the organism interfaces with the environment in an ev evolutionarily adaptive way. And adaptation means the ability to interface with the environment in a way where you can, you can differentiate between signal and noise, which is critical. And when, yeah. you see, when the noise comes through, you have to do something to, um, to change the organism in order to be able to adapt in the next generation. So what I'm saying is that the acquisition of those epigenetic marks, as they're referred to in the business, the data are then integrated into the egg and sperm, literally, biochemically, and then that's transferred to the zygote, and that zygote becomes an embryo, and that embryo becomes the offspring. So basically, it's really the, it's really the unicellular state that is the dominant um, um, Entity, not the comp, you know, not it's an it's a, it's an energetic process. It's not Darwin, you know, talking about reproductive mm -hmm. strategy. That's that's an ep, that's a gross epiphenomenon. And what I'm saying is that once you understand this process from from biologically, then the things you're talking about in terms of physics and uh, economics and every other aspect of human endeavor now there's an alignment of the of these things. It now makes sense. Mm -hmm. so I'm hearing you describe Ashby's you know, mechanical homeostat as it, it, just translating it into epigenetics, or at least there's a real similarity, uh, you know, with amplifiers and um, uh, uh, att attenuators. Yeah. Very, very cool. I, I'm well, not sure about Ashby. I think, um, I think one, one of the things which had really got me thinking about Peter's um, nil potency is it was a different way of describing homeostasis not as a sort of um, a somewhat two-dimensional process but a three-dimensional process reaching back into history and and I that's that seems to me a key difference between what Ashby describes and what John's describing and well, I think Peter's describing, describing too. Is actually homeoresis. Yeah. Homeoresis is across you know homeostasis as if you were to take the thermostat in your living room and throw it out the window, right? It's, yeah. it's moving through space and time. Yeah. That's, you know, I, I realized that a while back and I, I had committed to the homeostatic concept, which mm. was, you know, and trying to not deviate totally from, you know, the same way we think about physiology because Bernard and, you know, and Cannon talked, that they invented the, you know, Cannon invented the term homeostasis. So mm. I didn't want to be too, uh, uh, f you know, uh, inflammatory, and so I stuck with homeostasis. But in reality, <laughs> and this is something I've talked about this. It is, it's homeoresis. Mm. That gives you that third dimension, and and, and a fourth dimension actually. Mm. I mean, to be fair, Piaget was onto homeoresis. He he described his mechanisms as homeoretic. Uh -huh. um, and um, I can't remember the reference for that, but yeah, he was he was definitely onto this. So. Ask something here because, uh, say, the recent piece of work I've been working on with a colleague about you know cell concepts and kind of teaching expertise. One of the things I've been really preoccupied with in this is uh, feedback loops and control theory in terms of um, you know the the homeostasis, if you like, of of a uh, cell concept. Um, you know, self concept being in these contexts, we think of this self concept. Uh, of somebody acting competently in the world that's constantly evolving and adapting to them acting in the world. And um, what Banjir called self-efficacy, I suppose. And um, one of the things that seemed really relevant in this is just thinking about control theory. And uh, when we've kind of talked, you know, the word attractor, amplifier and attenuator has come up there. And what we were kind of finding in our um, you know, kind of research with trainee teachers is that 
they're constantly trying to, as they're trying to develop a self-concept of them as an expert uh, practitioner or, uh, you know, towards being an expert practitioner or competent practitioner, uh, is that, you know, there's regulatory feedback about what kind of is going to be the acceptable form of practice, what are the models of that, stuff that they learn vicariously, you know, they see systems of practice that are played out by experienced teachers that students understand and know the patterns of behaviour. But also what they're playing with is these kind of quite major, you know, positive feedback moments that are highly affective and highly emotional that are so powerful for change and, you know, to changing existing perceptions of them. But at the same, so they're having to manage between these two. And I just wondered, you know, if there was anything analogous at the cellular level, because I'm taking a kind of very complex system of lots of cells there doing this, um, you know, what, what are, is this idea, first of all, you know, what do we think of the idea of control theory when applied to in this way? Um, and, and, you know, what, what, what are the context of that? Is this thumb got up there? Absolutely. I'm just, a, I've just uh, been contracted to write a book, uh, the title of which is Hormones and Reality. So <laughs> I think of it in an endocrine sense, because what you're talking about in my, so the basic concept is that in order to transition from the, from Bohm's explicate, which is our conceived reality to the implicate or to approximate that we have to experiment. And so like Maslow's peak moments are really neuroendocrine moments where, you know, endorphins give you the runner's high, um, oxytocin is a huge effector of um, ho holistic behavior. But what I'm getting at is, it's actually what in physics, what's referred to as coherence and wave collapse. Once those calcium waves in your, in your being start to align with one another, another that's when you have that, exp and I, I start to sound like you know, Deepak Chopra, I'm not, that's not my intent. But, but what really is happening is you have these calcium waves that are all in sync. And all of a sudden you, you're starting to, you know, it's like meditation, it's the same idea. Yeah, okay, yeah. And I mean, and, just on, on that, you see, what I notice. So in a kind of tightly regulated, when you're, when you're, um, what it is to be human is so tightly regulated and you're experiencing this positive feedbacks. This is where I think you get high levels of anxiety because you've no way of dealing with that or changing appropriately because the system, you know, a wider system of policy and institutional practices is making you conform to a particular way of working. And this, when we go back to talking about being in the state of fear or this ongoing level of anxiety that stops you being able to think. I think that's what's happening. Yes. Oh, absolutely. I think there, there are, I think that there are exemplars of what I'm talking about that okay. make a practice of taking risk because they understand cause and effect. If you get out of sync with that vectorial, you know, uh, um, energy wave, carrier wave, whatever you want to call it, and you move, you deviate from that too much, then you get into a, you know, it's like disharmony. It, it is disharmony. And so in order to be able to, to, to advance as an individual within a society, you're either encouraged to take risk, uh, but there are ways in which there are safety features in that, or you're just that, you know, you're a risk taker and, you know, you die young or whatever. But my, I'm starting, you know, it's a little bit too hand wavy, but I'm saying, I agree with you. There yeah. are ways in which we can, in, you know, we can, you know, be, um, to thine own self be true kind of thing, where you know that you're on the right trajectory. Um, I mean, they, so we, so we, take, we take that into economics then, you see. So, you know, the, the economics of that in a, in a world where we model our finite resources is that we create competition, we create an unnatural level of competition between individuals competing over plenty of resources, but only resources, the only resources of value are the ones that the people who've taken risk and value, you know. Uh, the classic the example is, you know, Steve Jobs and, and was, was not yeah. Wozniak. Yeah, yeah. And and it, Alan, you know, the man managerial types and the creative types, that friction is what we're talking about. You know, the risk taker versus the money, the, the bean powder, right? Yeah, I, I think, yeah, I think that's right. And what's interesting is making these uh, biological and quantum connections along the way, you know, to things that, you know, in education, uh, in education research, you know, it's kind of like people have abandoned kind of 
philosophical. So I was talking about this, Mark, last night. They've abandoned kind of thinking uh, profoundly and interdisciplinary about it. It's just about measuring what's going on in a kind of, you know, in an area and just mm. seeing if that's connected yeah. to anything else. No, we're you done know, for. Kind of causality, you know. <laughs> standing on one leg for 10 minutes at the beginning of the day might improve maths education of yeah. year 10 kids, you know. And all that, instead of thinking about the way these things are connected together and of thinking philosoph philosophically about some of the problems. So I think connecting that with the biology is, is fascinating. And that's what we're kind of, I just don't know, just don't know enough biology, John. Yeah. <laughs> no, but that's a, it's, a, it's a chicken and egg problem because we're not trained this way. No. I mean, I mentioned to Mark, I, um, I've, I've had two, you know, mentors in my life whom I can still hear them talking in my head, a seventh grade scientist, a science teacher who, you know, he found a rabbit on the roadside and he brings it into the class and he's dissecting the damn thing. You know, he's bringing reality into the classroom. Yeah. And my classics professor in college who was talking about Suetonius and he said he was like, I don't know if this resonates, leave it to the ever. You know, it was like this relating to a sitcom. That's, that's, the, that's the secret in the sauce, as far as I'm concerned, is, is taking you know, reality and bringing it into an educational environment where all of a sudden yeah. ideas start to you know, create a, a life of their own, literally, you know, creatively. That's what we want, I think. I wonder if I can um, just check my own understanding of what we're talking about. So John, when you're talking about the multiple mechanisms which are working in our physiology, which are in sync. That seems to me to be very similar to what the quantum um, physicists talk about in terms of tensor networks. Yes. Um, and in fact, the machine learning people also talk about tensor networks. Peter, your rewrite system is articulating a kind of tensor network, isn't it? Yeah, I would say so, yes, without a doubt. So, so this, is, this is multiple variables working with each other and at some and, and of course, at some point, they they presumably they interact with each other to produce nothing, and so the nil potent is working with the tensor network to produce different levels of nothing. It, well, they I, try I, to produce nothing. Sorry, they sorry. Try to produce nothing. They try to produce nothing. Yeah. So is is this running through all our natural systems then? And is this something again trying to be practical? Is this something we should go looking for? And how might we go looking for it? Well, be bloody ice cream banner again, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but Mark, I've, I've suggested that we're, it's not, I don't, know, I don't know, Peter, whether you can relate to this, but, but I think that we're, it's not nothing, it's the singularity. That's what we're trying, yes. trying no, to do. When, when you say singularity, I, I think, I think it's, it, you see the same thing. We're trying to produce nothing, but they don't produce nothing. Yes. Right. Sure. Man is the measure then and we're and we derive from an ambiguous state. We have to be an asymptote. That's why we can't get back to the singularity. Mm. It's, we are the determinant of all of these criteria. I, I think I, I was just going to I was just going to say off that John is like the opposite, you know, the trying to get back to zero. The opposite of kind of life is to try and move up in the opposite direction or or you know create some meaning from that in uh, you know uh, perhaps peter why do you keep saying uh, i mean quite how uh, you said it two or three yeah, times it's, it does, it's doesn't get back environment. it's not on its own it's not the object on its own it's the object and its environment mm -hmm. that's what i'm saying that's what's trying to zero itself but it's but it doesn't of course but it's trying to but why can't it? I'm just curious. Why would you, would you say it doesn't? Every bit of the universe to do it. So it's a coordination problem, essentially. It, it can't. It can't do it. It. The, the object is a localized object, and the rest of the universe is its partner. And it can't really, you know, totally. Um, it ca it can't combine the rest of the universe into itself, into its localized position. But it trying to do that. Hmm. Yeah, um, interesting. Thank you. That's Thank an interesting you. philosophical issue. It's like I'm I'm tempted to think down the lines of uh, Peter thinking about that as whether from that perspective is are we sitting within that universe or outside of that universe? <laughs> <laughs>
Well, um, we consider it outside of us. Yeah. But, it, you know, we are really within that. Yeah. I mean, you well, can't see the rest of the universe, presumably. I mean, you can only see the things that you're looking at and then infer what the rest of the universe might be doing in reaction to it. Yeah. You, you, so you, 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 you know, if we started, you know, if, if everything began with us delineating explicate from implicate through the lipid system, and we then adapted to the environment that we found ourselves in serendipitously by endogenizing the factors in the environment, we are literally, you know, it's like Sagan always closed his Cosmos show with, you know, we are star stuff. We literally are stardust. And we've just compartment constrained it in a way where it works physiologically so yeah it's one big continuum mm. okay well let me try a reorientation because this keeps coming up in my mind um as elizabeth said that you can't increase the pie because there's a fixed level of resources and my immediate thinking about that is, um, is that really true? I mean, the whole point of a living system is the negative entropy, which is to bring in external energy. So the fixed level of resources assumes that you have access only to this immediate environment. The minute you can figure out how to get extra energy from somewhere else, you do have that opportunity and so that's my one thought that i'd like to hear followed up and then a second and related one <clears throat> there's an earlier discussion of uh, university structure and economics and so forth and so you know i'm in the middle of that at my own university right now and the way i'm thinking about it is that the uh the university board of trustees you know, at some level, think of themselves as the university. John mentioned the Harvard Corporation, which is its formal and official name. Uh, what do they do? Well, they send out probes into the universe, or at least into the university, and collect epigenetic markers. And based on these epigenetic markers, they think about them and make some readjustments into the structure of the system. But from my perspective as the faculty member, they're asking the wrong questions and therefore they're getting the wrong answers. Mm -hmm. And the answer that my university is getting, and I think most American and maybe else national, international are, uh, I'll just give a little piece of history to say it. 30 years ago, two thirds of the Temple University faculty were tenure track. And the university has been systematically cutting that back. So at the moment, it's about one third tenure track. And there are a couple of important differences between tenure track and non tenure track faculty. Tenure track faculty, I'm going to invent the number, get paid $10,000 to teach freshman economics. If you have a non-tenure track full-time faculty member, that person will get $7,000 to teach the same course. So clearly it's inefficient to have the higher priced faculty member. And you can do even better than that. If you hire an adjunct who's not a full-time person but is bought on a course by course basis, that person gets $3,000 to teach the same course. So in terms of short-term efficiency, you can get more undergraduates taught for way fewer dollars if you throw away the long-term development and the research capacity of the university. So those are my two thoughts, and I think they're related, but I haven't finished putting the pieces together yet. But I think what's really interesting about the, the idea of fixed resources and technology is that, and the, the discussion about energy, if you think about the Industrial Revolution, it was the first time that economies could harness power that wasn't animal or human. 
So you weren't reliant on a horse, you weren't reliant on a hand, you were initially reliant on water power and then with steam, you had a totally different power source. And that fundamentally transformed the productive capacity of the economy because you could take resources and all of a sudden do amazing things. So the second industrial revolution was blast furnaces, etc. And the other part that fundamentally changed economies, the argument is, is when you connected underwater sea cables. And so the cost of communication and the speed of communication went from how quickly a letter could be sailed to somewhere or even steam powered to somewhere to the cable connected you almost instantaneously. So the biggest revolution in terms of technology and communication wasn't computers. It wasn't the intersection of information technologies and the computing sector. It was actually undersea cables because it went from being six weeks to a second. And so, you know, ultimately those are all solutions of the human mind, thinking about the resources around them and then thinking, how can we readjust? How can we realign those? And I guess what's been running through my, my mind as we've talked is in, as the human mind tries to readjust all those resources around itself and make the pie bigger, the pushback you could sometimes argue all throughout human evolution has been that the natural system has pushed back when our ability to do that strains its capacity to accommodate us. So lots of societies go into reverse when the natural resource environment can't support it anymore. And you can think about that with the Mayans, you can think about it with lots of different societies, whether it's uh, virus pandemics, you know, black plagues, etc. People are living too close together, unhygienic conditions, whatever it is. Is that how economies ultimately get corrected? That, that the nil potency, that zeroing force, it's ultimately the natural system using these hierarchical structures then says, hang on a minute, you've gone beyond what can be accommodated. So it pushes back and we then have to push back again. So our, our minds come up with solutions and consumption rates that are just too far beyond the natural system to accommodate. I think the classic example of that is I was involved in the zero, um, you know, the, the zeroing of a population growth back in the 70s. So it was funded by the Ford Foundation. And, you know, these were noble ideas um, to limit um, a rep reproductive strategy. But, and the French were really the, the, the ahead of the curve. But then they realized that their Algerian uh, immigrants were, pop, were, were reproducing too, you know, faster than they could support, you know, and they were going to take over the political system. So we had to, you know, we had to relin relinquish that noble effort uh, in, in favor of uh, political power. So, yeah, I think that that's what you're talking about. But Rich, to your comment about, you know, the um, expediency of, uh, of um, adjunct faculty versus tenured faculty, in that equation, you've eliminated why somebody achieved tenure in the first place. They know stuff. They've done research. They're, they're knowledgeable. And so this is regression to the mean when you have people who are just reading one chapter ahead of the, you know, the, their, their students, you know, it is going to be the one that's, you know, going to be teaching. It's, it's a, it, it, the quality is not the same. And so I'll go back to my premise about the whole being greater than the sum of its parts. It no longer will be. It will be less than the sum of its parts and it will implode. And then you'll go down. <clears throat> but you skipped a step, John. Oh, well, I'm notorious. Yeah. Um, the step you skipped is that we're producing PhD students at the same or faster rate. So these people who are the adjuncts are actually as well qualified as you or me, and they're being paid one third of what they're worth mm -hmm. and not given the opportunity because they're also teaching four courses simultaneously instead of one or two. So they're not given the opportunity to do the research and publication that they need in order to get promoted. So it is a deliberate, conscious policy that has the effect of wasting most of the resource increase that was generated. So my two ment mentors as a graduate student and then in, uh, as faculty, both were firebrands, they went against the system and they demonstrated the validity of what they were talking about with regard to basic physiology of the endocrine system. And in the other case, a critically important disease that was cured. Yeah. I, I was taught by those people and I, and I took that on as 
this is doable. We can make ch for change. But if you have people teaching you who are just teaching to the text, you know, to, you know, the, the textbook, that's a self-limiting process. It's not sending the same message. So yeah, in the short run, maybe it maintains, you know, the the the, the lights are on and the, and, the, and the building is, you know, the HVAC works. <clears throat> so what in the great in the great scheme of things, it's going against the mission and vision of the institution. But the mission and the vision of the institution are what the board of trustees says it is. So if you're disagreeing with what the board says, I agree with you, of course. The board is the one who has control. So yeah, they are destroying their future. They're destroying the quality of the people they're producing. They're doing a disservice to their own graduate students. <coughs> it's very bad. Okay, uh, so I mean, I think there's, a, there's an important um, and deliberate misunderstanding of the purpose of education, which has occurred within higher education over the last 20 years. And it really, it can be summed up um, in, in the idea that somehow learning must be delivered to a market. And uh, I think clearly this is insane, but it's arisen through a whole set of very poorly um, articulated, uh, a very poorly articulated understanding of what education is. And there actually has been very little critical attention as to what the whole process of teaching is, what do teachers do, what do learners do, what goes on in that process, what's the biology of the process, all of these things. And they're not discussed in the literature. The, the education literature is appalling. It's almost been used as a way of upholding the status quo in the managerial institution. That's a good way of looking at it. Sorry, but I still want to bring in this other concept. I want to think of the Board of Trustees as the central thing sending out probes for the epigenetic markers and seeing what it's bringing back in. Why are they bringing back the wrong information? Yeah. Uh, let me suggest that the board of trustees are, is poorly constructed and, and uh, this will probably land wrong, but uh, I, I think you have to seriously consider uh, cooperatives where the people doing the work, in this case, the professors, actually make up the meta system. And uh, friends of mine in Brazil have a bunch of cooperative banks have been going for over 100 years or 117 of them. And they're, they're amazing. They're, they're my model for the future world. And, and it gets down to how do you keep the knowledge that the front line has and their vision uh, instantiated in the decision making above. And it, it works really well at less than 30 people. And Mondragon right. and others have figured out how to scale it, but that's what we need to be looking at. That's great. Right. Well, just wanted, let me give another example from my university. Um, so the board has, and the administration have put together a committee <clears throat> to investigate how to reopen in September if the reopening is the right thing to do. Uh, there's no faculty on that committee. Uh, the faculty union has been collecting information from the members, <clears throat> has made proposals about what they want, given them to the administration, has recommended that a representative of the union be included on this committee, and uh, they're busy spending noises at each other, sometimes paying attention to the existence of the noise, sometimes not, but nothing productive has happened. Yeah, I had a tool that I used uh, for seven years. It was amazing. If I, it had to be a crisis, but I could send out a survey all the way from the board down to the frontline people across a, a hospital in this case, but I used it in community as well. And you could see the variation in people's uh, uh, answers. It's very much like the VSM, uh, Mark, but, but it was derived empirically as opposed to biologically by metaphor with biology, but it was very, it's homomorphic with the VSM. And I got to tell you, when people could see visually color and color coded the, yeah. the differences in opinions, then, then they would have the missing conversations. See, I view society as, as a conversational entity. And the biggest problem we have is people don't recognize that there are missing conversations, that there are differences of opinion that are not based on ideology, they're based on experience. So what you really want is people with different experiences being able to recognize, even in the same executive team, in our executive team, when I would do this, who, people who 
Out of 66 questions, the chief operating officer is a good friend of mine. He changed 11 of his answers in one day. He learned so much from this conversation. So that's what I'm trying to build, but I don't care about institutions anymore. I actually care about neighborhoods. So I'm trying to re retool that stuff for neighborhoods. Oh, yes. I was just going to pick up that. Uh, um, I, you know, there's something went through my mind kind of thinking about what Mark was saying about, you know, the last 20 years, it's become the market. Actually, education has always been about the market. And I'd like to substitute for market. All market means is self-interest and the interests of groups that already have power and maintaining. One, you know, kind of economist around education said, you know, I was in a talk and he said, look, you know, if it's really a free market, as you as your students walked into your class they go right how much is it today prof yeah, and you yeah, go yeah. right well you know here's the price and well it isn't really a free market it is about self-interest or protecting interest but the but so education always has been about that the only anomaly is post-war social democracy uh, welfare state and um uh, keynesian economics that's the anomaly you know that was potentially a golden age uh, for some uh, but you know that so I, you know, um, that that's what we're kind of wrestling with. I think, you know, it's that, um, you know, that vision that was, you know, uh, from you know the end of the Second World onwards that was seen, you know, about a universal right to free education and access, and uh, you know, education as a public good rather than educating uh, for the purpose of uh, private interest, uh, which is the market. Okay, um, for, uh, we've been going an hour and a half, and, and I kind of suggest that we should stop. It just strikes me, though, talking about what, just listening to what Steve's just said, um, I'm very conscious that this this group has been going now for what I don't know about ten weeks or so, and we've, I mean, it's it's been uh, very good. It seems to me, none of us are being paid for do, to do this. So, and there there is a big thing in education about sort of. I don't know. It's, it's it's what are we doing? We're giving we're giving ourselves to this thing. When 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 we asked five students, we spent six weeks doing it with the uh, high school students who were disaffected. They were really smart kids, but they wouldn't go to high school. And we worked with them to create uh, maps of their what their learning interest. Mentors were a huge deal. And, and what they meant were people who were really doing real work in the community that they could go learn from and with. Mm. And uh, I'm with you. I think that we can create a substantial part of education being done uh, by elders uh, or people who are actually um, accomplishing something, you know, that are failing and succeeding. So uh, maybe it's not where you're going, but I, when you map a neighborhood, what you find, quite surprisingly to me, not in retrospect, but at the time, you find the main organizing thing in neighborhood or associations, to your point, people who are not paid, who, who, who coalesce around a particular idea. When you map a whole neighborhood, you realize there's a network of associations to keep the neighborhood running. Because in this country, there's no formal governance of neighborhoods. Yeah, so well, something... Mark, I am going where you're, where you're thinking. Yeah. And um, I think... The, the interesting thing that's going to happen in the next two or three months is, is going to be an awful lot of very bright unemployed people around the world. And they're going to reorganize themselves in interesting ways. And uh, I think, you know, that's, that's an interesting prospect. Might not, it might not feel great, but it, 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 it will introduce a change or introduce changes that we haven't necessarily considered up until this point. Well, could I say, and perhaps to conclude, if you go to Liverpool University, as I did this week, <laughs> there is the, the Blackwell's bookshop, the last bookshop in Liverpool is closed and there is grass growing on the doorstep. You may have seen it. Yeah. The university is still full of administrators in their offices, <laughs> um, but they've got rid of the students and they, uh, they have their perfect university and they've got rid of the staff. <laughs> and it's like an ideal situation for them. They're running a perfect, simple university they can understand and all the problems are gone. Yes.
the problems are all in this discussion group. Yeah, they, they outnumber us two to one, don't they? The administrators, or more, <laughs> more than that, it's more than two to one. It's past they the have, line. They have won, and they're in their offices now, gloating. I, I have to say, I'm one of those administrators. So. <laughs> oh no, no! <laughs> so we should bill you, actually. Yes. <laughs> And you Hopefully you're a Trojan horse. <laughs> Mark, Mark. <laughs> All right. Look, it's been really great fun. We started with hospitals and we've ended with universities. The problem is once you get into universities, it's very hard to get out of them. But um, uh, it, I think... In four years, I'll give you a degree. Sorry, Sorry. hospitals as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, they're both institutions that... Uh, that <laughs> there's a there's a good chance of dying. It's just um, you, one kills you rather more quickly than the other one. But um, one kills your body, one kills your mind. Yeah, okay. yeah, I think so. Um, kills the will to live. <laughs> <laughs> so this is basically an intensive care unit here, right? I, I, this is an intensive care unit. This, I, I, you know, I'm beginning to. Is is this an arc? <laughs> You know, when I lose my job, at least I've got somewhere to go when I can have an, in an intelligent conversation. <laughs> wow. I don't know. But um, <laughs> we should think about how to move this forwards in a way where we don't get stuck with ranting about the university. Because you, you, we, we will get stuck there. <laughs> and I hope I wasn't ranting because my intention was to use these as specific examples of the general topics that we were discussing. Yes, no, absolutely, Richard. I think, um, yeah. Mark, I, I would go in exactly the opposite direction. I would say, let's take the university, let's take all um, uh, ancient institutions, uh, ancient is a relative term, uh, the American medical sy system, uh, the universities, frankly, uh, nation states, yeah. all of these things that are being exposed uh, because of the current stress uh, as uh, inadequate and try to find patterns um, uh, uh, around which they can be recreated because I think they're actually self-similar enough that we shouldn't walk away from, we shouldn't get lost in the mess. We should say, how? what are the patterns by which a, a better future than the one that we all knew was corrupt, you know, now has become obviously corrupt. So I, I hope we stay with it, but not in the, you know, complaining mode, but in a design mode. Yeah. Okay. Right. Well, until next week. Okay. Um, thank, you, thank you ever so much. And um, yeah. If anybody's interested in, um, we, we, we are holding a conference for an organization called the Alternative Natural Philosophy Association. And this is happening in August. They're gonna be online presentations. Um, this is um, a group uh, which is, revolves around physics, but it's not just physics. It includes, it includes everything else. So um, we have presentations from biology and all sorts of things. If anyone's interested in giving a paper, and we're, we're basically going to do it over a four week period. So we'll have one presentation a day. Um, uh, if anyone's interested, then then send us an email. Yes, would you send a, um, a piece of paper describing the conference? I will do. Yes, I will do. I just wanted to mention, you know, the great social thinker, Louis Menon, published a book entitled uh, The Marketplace of Ideas, which I found fascinating because, you know, he's an ideologue, but he's talking about selling ideas. So he's trying to merge the mercantile interests with, you know, the, the uh, life of the mind, which I, maybe that's what we're trying to achieve is that synthesis, you know, that hybrid, that synthesis. Yeah, I, I, yes, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, thank you very much. It's been great fun. And uh, I'll see you next week. Yep. See you next week. Bye-bye. Okay, Bye-bye. Ciao, ciao.